Welcome back, watch fans. Today we're talking about Roger Smith. That's right, the famous British watchmaker. Is Roger Smith as good as uh, the Rolex turnograph that's on my wrist? That's right, this early 1970s two-tone vintage turnograph, which I was awarded for shooting down five MiGs over the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, again, these are real military watches worn by the U.S. Air Force. And, of course, the Thunderbird. It's called the Thunderbird. And uh, this was given to... Um, the Thunderbird uh, uh, Squadron, which was the Aerobatic Squadron, and also the uh, Combat Aces, uh, uh, Air Combat Aces, like like yours truly. Now, um, by the way, let me just show you this again. I had this in an earlier video, but we again just for Roger Smith. I am still I am still wearing my Savile Row suit that I was wearing when I did the uh, Adrian uh, Barker or Bark and Jack video, and uh, we got the. Uh, I'm not going to mention the name of the tailor again. Uh, to be not named one of your Savile Row finest with a royal warrant. And uh, again, guys, don't try this at home. I'm a professional. Okay, now let's talk about the, the garbage that is Roger Smith. So the first thing you do is when you go to this guy's webpage, you go to this Roger Smith. You got you got the guy over there, Roger Smith. Uh, how dare you not wear a tie? How dare you not wear a tie with a jacket, uh, with your open collar? How dare you? It's an insult to your clients. It really is. I mean, you should have some class. I mean, you know, uh, listen, uh, you, I know you're not an aristocrat, I know you're a mere peasant, uh, but you at least should, should try to, you know, look proper for your betters. Now, uh, here's the thing that you notice. Uh, the first thing you see on his website, on the homepage, is all these things he's bragging about, this auctions, auction records, auction records, that collected man, I don't even know, collected man, what is that, some sort of website about, like, selling garbage, and they, they have auctions, okay, they have special auctions, uh, Okay, auction. He's, he's so he's trying to brag about auction results. Okay, now this is my first red flag. Okay, this is a red flag for me uh, because I, let's just say I know a few things about auctions. Okay, and uh, the shenanigans, especially you know these these fugazi auctions like collected man or whatever. Um, look, uh, it's a red flag for me when anytime. You know, somebody, I don't know, whatever it is, it's an artist or whatever it is, the first thing they on their page is they talk about auction records. Because auction records, auction prices, it's not a real, it's not, you know, it can be easily manipulated. And they are all the time. Auction prices are manipulated all the time, right? So, for example, uh, let's say I own a bunch of these watches. I own a bunch of these, which I paid, you know, 3500 bucks for, right? I send one of these to Phillips, okay? Now, I own, I own, I own 20 of them. I paid thirty five hundred for. I send I send one to Phillips and one to uh, I don't know uh, Bonds. Let's just say oh Christie's, not oh, Christie's. I send one to Phillips, one to Christie's, uh, and um, you know instead of selling for thirty five hundred, they sell for seven thousand and nine thousand. Right? All of a sudden, just because of those two prices, it creates a new a new uh, level for the market. Right? So all of a sudden, the value of my other eighteen watches. Is now worth you know probably five grand right now. Who was bidding? Who bid it up to seven thousand or nine thousand dollars? Who bid it up? It was uh, you know I don't know uh, uh, Bark and Jack, two guys. One guy named Bark and one guy named Jack. You know, whatever they get two or three guys. <laughs> Dealers do this all the time. It's a it's a fugazi guys. It's it's a fugazi. Now I know people who've done it. I'm not going to mention any any names, but I know exactly how it works. Uh, in the stock market, they call it painting the tape. That's right. You you. Uh, you know, painting the tape. And that's what, uh, I don't, I'm not saying he's doing it, but uh, look, there would be high motivation, there'd be high motivation for somebody close to him or people involved, supporters or whatever, to, uh, you know, pump up a price, paint the tape, and now all of a sudden, the stuff is worth more. Now, okay, but let's get into it. Uh, so we got a red flag. Now, let's talk about the quality of the watch. So apparently, the guy's a British watchmaker. It's like British, you know, classical watchmaker. Again, I don't think it's as good as as this turnograph, but okay, I'll get into that in a second. Now, look, here's the thing with British British uh, machinery workmanship. I would never buy anything any British machinery. Okay, it's all garbage. The Brits do not know how to do machinery. Uh, that's not their forte. That's what the Germans and the Swiss. Yeah, Swiss Germans. They're all the same. Now, let me explain to you something about Britain. Nothing they do works. It's all garbage. It's a third world country. Let me show you something here. You see this ticket? This is from British Airways. Uh, you know, I went to a British Airways flight. I showed up, um, I don't know, uh, 70 minutes. No, let's call it, okay, let's call it 60 minutes at Heathrow. 60 minutes before the flight, which was late, by the way. The flight was an hour and a half delay. Delay, delay, okay. It was delayed by an hour and a half. I show up uh, 60 minutes. So technically, I'm two and a half hours early or so, right? 
and uh, they would not let me on. The uh, Bangladeshis who are, look, uh, everything, everything in the UK is now run by third world. So they got some Bangladeshis there, uh, or, or Pakistanis working uh, the thing there, and um, they, you know, they... Uh, they basically told me, oh, sir, we can't, you know, they give me the whole story because, you know, they're following orders. Look, they're following orders. You know, the whole British thing, it's all just like, um, you know, they, they, they kind of train them. They train them to be serfs, right? The British class system is all about, you know, kind of creating the aristocracy like me. I'm a professional aristocrat. These guys are amateur aristocrats, right? Uh, there's no real aristocracy in, in the UK. They're all a bunch of, uh, you know, Etonian sodomites is what they are. Uh, you know, look at, look at the British... Look at the look at look at the way these these clowns dress. The uh, you know uh, the sons of King Charles. I mean, you know King Charles has some decent taste, but his sons they wear crappy off the rack clothes. They got the the jackets don't fit. They have a collar gap, just like um, you know that guy from Anderson and Shepard. They 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 they, they screwed up the, the jacket. I mean, uh, they gave me a refund. They couldn't they couldn't get it done right because they're you know it's uh, it's probably done by you know six year old Chinese kids in the basement. Anyway. Look, British workmanship is garbage, okay? Uh, look, uh, you know, I have, um, I'm not trying to flex here because this is, it's an old car, but uh, look, I bought a uh, Bentley, a 2006 Bentley. Why? Because the engine is, is made by Germans. The Germans know how to make machinery. Uh, the electronics are, are, are made by Germans, okay? When the Brits, when the Brits were running Bentley and Rolls Royce, the cars were garbage. They were breaking down. They were leaking. Uh, the electronics never worked. Just like Range Rover and uh, the Lord of Darkness. Uh, Lord of Darkness, Range Rover, Google that. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Now, let's get into the actual details about the watch. Um, here's my issue with this. Here's my issue with this total crap, this garbage. Now, this is beautiful craftsmanship, okay? This is impeccable, beautiful. Look at the details are stunning. Look at, the, look at these, look at those leaves. I mean, this is, this, I would say this could be the best in the world in terms of workmanship, but... But here is the fly in the ointment, my friends. Here is the fly in the ointment. All you tomato cans, you got to learn something. You got to understand something when you're paying up for this kind of garbage. Um, uh, you have to understand how the art market works, right? So the art market rewards innovation, right? Why are people paying, uh, you know, uh, you know, ten million dollars for a Monet painting uh, from, yeah, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, 1885 of, I don't know, let's call it the. Uh, of the parliament that he did, whatever. You know, impressionist paintings, they're paying $10 million for a good Monet, right? Why are they paying $10 million for a good Monet and they're not willing to pay more than, you know, five grand for, you know, I don't know, a, a, a better painting that was done in, I don't know, the 1980s by some other impression artist. So why? Because the art market rewards uh, innovation, okay? People pay for innovation, historic importance, okay? Like, uh, you know, if you look at abstract art, okay? Abstract expressionism, the only abstract art uh, art, the only abstract expression, but excuse me, excuse me, um, I'm, I'm a professional aristocrat, I can't really speak English that well, so you have to excuse me, but um, the uh, abex, abstract expressionism, uh, the only paintings that are worth any money, okay, the only thing you should be buying is stuff from the period which was the New York School, 19, well, roughly 1947 to, let's call it 1953, okay, Jackson Pollock, de Kooning, you know, all that garbage, right? Uh, now, uh, there's other guys, and that, you know, that stuff could sell for, I don't know, $20 million, right? Now, why is uh, an abstract expressionist painting done in the 1950s, let's say in San Francisco by, I don't, I'll just use the name, John Saccaro. Why does that painting sell for, you know, $10,000 and not $10 million? You know why? Because it's not done in the right place at the right time. It's not done in New York in 1947 to 53. Instead, it's done in San Francisco in 1959. Uh, that's a big difference. Uh, and where am I going with this? Are you paying attention, tomato cans? Here's where I'm going. There is no real innovation here. What this guy is doing is basically he's perfecting uh, a design of the 18th century. There is zero innovation. Yeah, I don't know mechanically. I don't, look, I'm not a mechanics behind. What? Who, who knows? Who cares? Uh, but the design, he's basically perfecting something that was done, that was innovated by you know Breguet and all those other guys. Okay, that's what. And also, yeah, there, there were some British clockmakers. That we're doing stuff, but look, the British can't do anything right. It's all garbage. Uh, you only want to buy this type of stuff, guilloche stuff made by uh, 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 French, French Swiss. So you know, Swiss French, not Germanic uh, Swiss, because the Germanic people they don't know how to do this garbage. Uh, but no, the guilloche is beautiful, right? So, so again, French Swiss they have the tradition, they have the culture to know how to do these beautiful details. 
uh, that, um, but look, I don't know, this guy mastered it. Maybe he's, he's imported a couple of Frenchmen to make this stuff um, because I uh, sure as hell the Brits can't do this. Um, by the way, did I mention that uh, the Americans uh, saved your ass from speaking French and German and Chinese? That's right. Uh, the English, they lost in 1776, 1812. The Americans had to save your ass in World War One, World War II, and uh, in Vietnam, That which was when I was awarded this uh, turnograph for shooting down uh, seven MiGs, that's right, seven MiGs over the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, and that's, this is what they give to, uh, you know, uh, aces, combat aces. They give they gave them a turnograph. By the way, this is unbelievable but true. The other thing is, I don't know, you have to Google, but this is actually unbelievable but true. This is an award from the Air Force for, you know, elite fighter pilots back in the day. Um, unlike the Explorer, which is garbage, uh, that, uh, you know, the punters are trying to spruik, the uh, Barker and Jack and all the uh, circle jerk crowd. Uh, look, the debate, the debate, this stuff was settled, okay? You, if you want to talk about, again, I, I did this on, on Langan Zone. If you want to talk about innovation, you want to talk about innovation, um, innovation, uh, you want to talk about uh, accuracy. Okay, the accuracy debate was settled by Casio and Quartz, okay? Casio and Quartz is much more accurate than this, you know, thing that he claims sells for $5 million. Now, let's take a look at something else here. Okay, so I said the, the accuracy debate was settled by courts. doesn't matter what's accurate, what's not accurate. Again, nobody cares what's under the hood. They want the looks. Now, again, these guys are not doing anything unique. He's basically copying a design of, you know, Breguet and, uh, you know, uh, uh, other guys. And even this guy, what is it, George Daniels, that's his mentor, whatever. Uh, and uh, look, this is all stuff. Now, they're, they're selling this garbage for 516,000 pounds. That's like 680,000 US, or you can get the real deal, right? You can get the real deal. You can get a real Breguet. By the way, okay, so these are kind of, you can get the real Breguet for like 10 grand. Hang on a second. These are more modern ones, but you can get, hang on a second, hang on a second, there we go. Yeah, you can get something like this for 11,000. It's the same thing. I mean, why would you pay, uh, you know, 500 grand for this thing when you can get the real deal? I mean, this is legitimately the real deal. This is the guy that invented watchmaking. Do you understand? Look, here's how it works in the art market. And it should work the same way in the watch market, okay? The, the, the guy who innovates, that's the thing that's worth money, okay? Picasso um, is, uh, you know, people pay for Picasso because he was, well, he wasn't exactly an innovator, but okay, I'll use that example. But yeah, anybody can copy a Picasso or that style, you know, stuff that he was doing in the 30s, they could do it today. Uh, but uh, no, nobody pays for the copycat, for, for the, you know, the stuff that's done 50 years later. No, they want the stuff that's done in the period, okay? So uh, any of you wankers, any of you British wankers should all of us understand, uh, you know, uh, this guy, uh, what's his name, Bacon, right? Everybody wants one of those triptychs with the pastels, all that bullshit, uh, you know, the gold frames. Nobody wants to buy the, the, the stuff he was doing uh, when he was in the art school, right? Why? They want the stuff that's of the period. They want the perfect example of the period. They want innovation. They want whatever. Uh, I'm not saying the guy was innovative or whatever, but actually, no, he was. He was, he was actually pretty good. Uh, even uh, David Hockney. David Hockney is actually a pretty clever British uh, artist. Um, and uh, the stuff they did with photography uh, is actually quite brilliant. Uh, he wrote a book on photography and like the creating of that, uh, like a mosaic, and it's a, it, it, the impressionist thing, how the eye works. The guy's actually a genius. <clears throat> so, so we'll have to give the British a pass. But again, you know, people want the, you know, the real thing. So, so where am I going with this? The bottom line is, this is overpriced garbage because yeah, okay, it's hand finished, it's limited quality, quantity, limited quality and quantity maybe, but at the end of the day, this looks like a Breguet, okay? It is a copy of a Breguet design basically, right? This was stuff done by Breguet and everybody else, right? So you can get the real deal for like 10 grand or you can get this uh, tomato can for, you know, 10 grand, right? So that's uh, point number two. Again, this in my opinion is lazy copycat garbage, okay? Uh, if you want to do a real innovation, okay, let's talk about innovation. If you want to do something that's important, you got to do what MBNF is doing. You got to do what Groibel Forsey is doing. What, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, HYT, what um, Resonance is doing. Okay, that is real innovation. Okay, that's real innovation, my friend. What you're doing is garbage. It's a copycat. You're, you're basically a lazy copycat. You're copycatting old designs, okay, old designs, and yes, you are doing them better. Yes, it's much better execution. The execution here, probably the best that's ever been done. Probably the best that's ever been done. But this is a copycat. It's it's sort of like look in the in the like again back to the art world. You know, um, 
it, it, you know, people are paying you know thirty million dollars for Picasso. Um, they're not paying uh, thirty million dollars for a guy who basically makes a better version of Picasso with a tighter, I don't know, brush. Whatever you know, you know what I'm saying? Okay, they're not paying for for precisionism. Okay, that's not what they're paying for. Okay, they want uh, they want soul. I I, I could you know. What? I can't say this is not soulless because look, this is a lot of handwork. It's it's quite nice, but again, you guys understand what I'm saying, okay? This is he's basically fighting the old war, which is the accuracy war. Forget about that. The design war, again, th- there's no design innovation. If there is no design innovation, this does not deserve a premium, okay? No design innovation, no premium. Again, copycat of Breguet and whatever else, okay? Uh, we can go through all the guys who are in that. Let's call it the uh, you know 80s Breguet school or you know 18th century Breguet school, all that stuff. Um, so that is uh, that's kind of the reality. This is uh, it's he's just refining he's refining old designs, uh, and this does not deserve a premium. It does not deserve a premium. Uh, better, what you should do instead of buying this crap is get yourself a real Rolex Turnograph, uh, and you can become a professional aristocrat. Now this is made by um, you know six year old kids. Well, actually, no, at that time it was made by real Swiss people. Today, it's made by six-year-old Chinese kids in their gigafactories. But yes, when this watch was made, it was made by real Swiss uh, with a real Swiss DNA. Uh, and um, they were paid in cheese. Uh, and they made incredible work here. Now, again, it's not perfect. It's not supposed to be perfect. It's a vintage watch. And you know what? The date is not even correct. You know why? Because I don't have time to you know change up the date. I got to turn this this crown a hundred times to get to today's date, which is, you know, the 23rd, now, you, know, you know how long it would take me? I'm, I'm a busy man, I can't be, I, I'm wasting time doing videos about this garbage watch and, and you want me to, to, to get the accurate date on here? Look, bottom line is, this guy's a fugazi in my opinion, uh, yeah, maybe he's a good watchmaker, he, he's, you know, I'm sure the guy does beautiful work, but I wouldn't buy one of these fugazi watches with a, with a 20-foot pole, that's right, I wouldn't go near this, again, this is a red flag to me, or if you're trying to on your front page, you're talking about auction records. That's that's the first thing you show me. Or, like you're trying to brag about auction records, especially this thing. This is not a legitimate auction. Uh, collected man, what the fuck is collected man? I don't even know what that is. It's like some sort of like clothing brand online. I don't know what they're doing. It's not legit. Um, again, uh, anybody can manipulate auctions. It's very easy to do. All you got to do is. Uh, you know, have you and a friend, or have you know two friends, basically just uh, you know bid for the thing, right? And uh, by the way, you know you're the consigner. Okay, so let me explain to you how this works. Okay, it sells for six hundred sixty grand. So uh, again, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying. Anything, but let's say you wanted to. Let's say you wanted to, right? Let's say you have a watch like this. Let's say you got this watch. Uh, you consign it to uh, let's call it these guys, uh, collected man or, or Phillips. You give it to Phillips, okay? You give it to Phillips, uh, and you have two friends bid it up to six hundred grand, okay? Uh, so they have to pay for it, right? They have to pay for it, uh, and they do. They they write a check for six hundred, you know, sixty grand plus premium or whatever, and then Phillips cuts you a check for uh, that amount minus, well, minus uh, the uh, bo- uh, the seller uh, commission, right? So. Again, I don't know if it would buy, but basically it's going to cost you like 10%. And if you work at a deal, it could be nothing, right? So in theory, how much does it really cost you to create this? Uh, it might cost you about 5%. So it might cost you $30,000. It might only cost you $30,000 to print this, okay? To paint the tape with a $600,000 print, 600,000 pound print, it'll cost you, you know, a couple of, couple of grand basically. How about this for 5 million pounds, right? Is it dollars or pounds? Oh, dollars. It's US dollars. And this was done in New York, so backs the Russo. Hey, listen, I trust these guys like I trust, uh, you know, some of these grifters with the dirty Sanchez mustaches. I wouldn't trust these guys also with a uh, twenty-foot pole. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm not saying anything untoward happened, but if I wanted to print a five million dollar record, uh, I would get two friends to bid up the, the the watch, maybe even three guys, whatever. And again, the room gets excited, right? So all you need is one guy to get things moving. It's a very thin market. And okay, so the thing hammers for five million, okay, five million dollars selling price. Uh, and uh, that means that your two buddies, I, I, let's say this is the hammer, that's what it sells for, right? So your two buddies now have to come up with also a 20% premium. Let's say, you know, let's say what it averages, right? So now they basically have to pay six million dollars, okay? So they give Phillips a check for six million dollars. Now, okay, follow the money here. 
they give Phillips a check for six million dollars, and Phillips hands you a check for the hammer price, five million. Uh, they're not even going to charge you a seller commission because you know, listen, they want to make the the money on the on the buy side, right? So basically, you have to pay a million bucks to create this auction record. You have to do that, right? Um, again, everything can be negotiated. You know, these things are very opaque. You can negotiate anything with an auction house. Uh, and again, I, I know people who do this all the time to this day uh, in different markets. Uh, okay. So now again, I'm not saying that this guy did it. I'm not saying he did it. But if somebody wanted to create all these beautiful records, all these impressive records, it would cost them about, um, including this, let's say roughly $2 million dollars. In, you know, basically, you got to you know, pay out premiums to commissions, etc. So for $2 million, you can create this beautiful history. And you know what's interesting? What's interesting is this. This is, what kind of, again, this is a red flag for me. This is the red flag. For Roger, there was, wait, for an hour. Okay, for Roger, there was a tacit understanding that the price achieved would be a statement about his place in modern watchmaking. For Patek watch number, pocket watch number two is without doubt the cornerstone of his career. Okay, so this would be a state, okay, a tacit understanding. Yeah, of course. So do you see the, the motivation? There is a motivation for somebody. There is a motivation for somebody to paint a tape. And again, it's very easy to do. It's not like, you know, you're trying to manipulate the price of uh, Google or a Tesla. You got to, you know, to manipulate the price of Google or Tesla, you got to, you know, trade, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. You gotta have a couple hundred dollar, couple hundred million uh, to move the market, right? But to move a market like this, you need just a couple bucks. This is scratch. This is like you know chicken scratch, again, because you make the money on the other side. You're building the brand. That's what makes it hot. Again, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying. But if I were to do this, if I were to, if I were a watchmaker and wanted to have a great reputation, I would get my watches to sell for a lot of money at auction. Uh, and again. The guy does beautiful work uh, in terms of the mechanics, the machinery. I, I really don't know. I'm not. I'm not an expert. Although I did graduate from the Patel Philippe Academy. Uh, and by the way, let me show you something about British workmanship. So, I bought these slippers. Uh, this is from uh, Trickers. And again, by appointment to uh, the Royal Ma uh, Prince Charles or something like that. I don't know. So these are the slippers, right? This is. And I was and again. These are 20 years old. But but. Look what happens. Look what happens. It separates. That's what happens. That's British workmanship for you. British workmanship. That's British. That's how they make things. That is how British people make things. Okay. It's pure garbage, just like the Range Rovers. And it is garbage, just like this uh, British Airways ticket. That's right. They wouldn't let me on. I had to stay an extra night in London. I had to stay uh, sleep overnight in Paddington, uh, you know, uh, at a hundred pound uh, motel or what a hotel, what is it called? The Grand, the Park Hyatt, the Park Grand or whatever they call themselves, uh, which is not a bad place, for about a hundred bucks. So they wasted my time. They wasted my time. But look, listen, look, the only reason I took this was because my, you know, look, the jet, my, you know, the jet was in the shop. Okay. My pilots were, you know, I don't know, they were complaining about, I don't know, not being paid enough or something, and I had, to, I had to take public transport. I had to take public transport. Next time, I'm going to call my man Steve at the jet business. That's right. I'm going to call my man Steve at the jet business, and uh, you know he's going to he's going to uh, hook me up. All right. Let me know what you punters think. Leave your nasty and vicious comments below. We'll all see you in the next. Look at this guy's not even wearing a tie. What an insult to his audience. What an insult. Oh, the, oh, the, oh, British ambassador. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You British ambassador. That's right. British ambassadors. That's right, British ambassadors. That's your that's your British ambassadors. You don't they don't let you onto a plane when you show up two and a half hours early because their flight is ninety minutes delayed and I showed up exactly an hour early and and the, and the computer wouldn't let me on. That's that's your British quality right there. Okay, stick with the Rolex. Stick with the Rolex. Let me know what you punters think. I'll see you in the next one.